Um, I, I fear that many of us would be a little bit tired of um, Zoom talks. Uh, maybe you're not, but but I, I, I am a bit a bit fed up with so many Zoom stuff. So uh, I decided to try to do this Blackboard style. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time because I think if, if you don't interrupt me, I can just keep talking uh, for myself all the time and, and I'll forget uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, just, just interrupt me if anything is not clear or if, if you have any questions. So uh, let me talk about this uh, dark neutrino portal. Uh, so let me start with the motivation, uh, which is related to neutrino masses, and then I'll address the mini bone anomaly. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to stitch these uh, two things together where uh, some new phenomenology uh, should show up. So uh, neutrino masses, uh, as you know, uh, we, we don't know what is the origin of neutrino masses. So in a nutshell, we know that first the mass of neutrinos, you know, very uh, not properly defined is below about EV-ish, okay? Uh, and the next uh, uh, mass that we have in the standard model mass spectrum is the electron, which is 511 uh, keV. And if you keep going, there will be the top somewhere, which is about 170 GeV, right? So um, one question we have is why are neutrino masses so light? Uh, we know that it's at most about an EV, but at least about, maybe I should do this, at least about for one of the neutrinos, 0.05 electron volts. Uh, one neutrino could be massless, but the heaviest one is at least that. So one question is why are neutrino masses so small? And uh, more than that, if you, if you just go in the theory side and you try to do the Higgs mechanism for neutrinos, so you start writing, so say that you want to do something like this, you have a Yukawa, you have the lepton doublet, you have the Higgs, and you have uh, a right-handed neutrino. The, the first thing that shows up in this Lagrangian is that there is a term that you can always write, which is this. If you want, I, I can put uh, an R here to say that this guy is right-handed. And this term here is a Majorana mass, Majorana mass uh, term for the right-handed neutrino, which changes the, the neutrino mass uh, matrix into something like uh, this, uh, Y Higgs VEV, Y Higgs VEV, uh, where my, my, my Higgs VEV is uh, 170 GV, so I don't have the square root of two here, and the Majorana mass. And that's completely different from all uh, Sonomoto fermions because now, usually in the Sonomoto fermions, uh, in the Dirac spin, you have four degrees of freedom, uh, no left, right, particle, left, right, antiparticle, particle and antiparticle, uh, left, right, they all have the same mass. Here is a little bit different because now you have the left-handed neutrino, the right-handed neutrino, but the mass term is not trivial. So now you're splitting the Dirac spinner. And if M, if the mass, the Majorana mass is much larger than YV, then you have that this mass matrix gives you uh, two eigenvalues, one which is basically m, the other one which is y square v square over m, which is the mass of the light neutrino. Uh, and that's seesaw. No, that, that's very simple. But the question actually, the, the, the point is that um, this is a possibility, but there are several other possibilities. Uh, so we don't know basically where neutrino masses come from. And especially we, do, we don't know why they are so light. So here's a proposal. Um, it's perhaps as good as any other, but it is a proposal, uh, which is imagine that uh, neutrino masses, they start being zero and they are, lift, uh, they are lifted from zero uh, when some, uh, some symmetry is broken. And that's like what, 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 what we know how to do and what we like to do. Now, if something is very close to zero, Maybe it's because there was a symmetry protecting it. So imagine that I, 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 I say that my right hand neutrino under some new uh, U1 uh, uh, group has charge, whatever, this is uh, arbitrary, say plus one. Now, the problem is that um, if you just postulate a U1 like that, it's global U1s are a bit tricky. Uh, it's, it's not like they, they, there's nothing wrong with them, but uh, there's no dynamics associated. So in some sense, when you say there is a 
a symmetry that there is no when which there is no dynamics for which there is no dynamics associated that pro, uh, protects neutrino masses is a sort of a circular argument. So you're basically saying neutrino masses are zero because there is a symmetry that has nothing associated to that, because I'm saying there is. I don't know, for me, it doesn't sound so appealing. So it sounds more appealing to have this as a, a gauged symmetry so that there is dynamics uh, and and uh, in some sense, well, I don't I don't want to say that this is a real symmetry, but it's a, it's a gauge symmetry, right? It's a dynamical symmetry. So let's call this U1, U1 dark. Now, the nice thing about uh, gauge symmetries is that for the consistency of the, um, uh, quantum field theory, you need to cancel uh, chiral anomalies, right? So you, 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 you need to cancel some combinations of charges for left-handed, right-handed fields. And if this is all there is, a right-handed neutrino with charge one under this U1, uh, this um, model would be anomalous, right? So, so being anomalous doesn't mean that it breaks at a high scale, it means that it doesn't make any sense. It breaks at all scales. Therefore, uh, the easiest solution, uh, let me let me add a page here. The easiest solution is, and let me put these guys in another page. I don't need them right now. The easiest solution is the following, um, is to add another particle, let me call n prime, with charge minus one. So of course, I'm, I'm saying that this particles are right-handed fields, but in some sense, this is just a, uh, if you want, it's just a vector-like particle. So differently from the standard model uh, where uh, right-handed and left-handed have different uh, charges, uh, uh, vector-like particles, the right-handed and left-handed have the same charges. So you can write a mass term for them. Uh, but now that the, there is a symmetry, there's a gauge symmetry and this is the start of my model. So this, this is basically on, is based on this paper um, here. I think, yeah, on this paper here, uh, which I did in collaboration with uh, Enrico Bertuzzo, uh, Sudip Jana, and Renata Funchal. So if you start with this, this particle content, the first thing that happens is that you need to couple these particles to neutrinos, okay? So uh, what you need to do, uh, say that this N is a standard model singlet, no? So now you want to do something like this, for instance, and under this U1, this guy has no charge. This guy has charge, uh, I said, plus one. So now it's obvious I need a doublet with uh, uh, the same quantum uh, numbers as the Higgs, but now a U1 charge, U1 dark charge. So let me call this guy phi. Uh, and let me, let me write a one here so that you know that this phi has charge plus one, okay? The one is just going to be the charge. It's just for us to keep track of uh, which scalar has which charge. So I put the phi here uh, and the tilde, uh, just phi and the Higgs. So now that's okay, that's uh, a gauge invariant term. So now uh, you have a, uh, a Yukawa term between the neutrinos and this dark neutrinos. And I call them dark because they are related to a dark sector where there is a uh, U1 gauge symmetry. The only problem is that with this and this alone, the uh, mass matrix for neutrinos would become something like this. So let's say this is the, the light neutrino. Uh, this is, let me move this guy up here. This is N and this is N prime. And I'm not keeping track of left and right and, and conjugate uh, just for simplicity, but this would be Y phi one, Y phi one. Uh, you can put the tilde if you want. It's not a big deal. And then you have a, a, a vector-like mass because you can always add, add something like this, n, n prime, right? Uh, uh, because this guy have the different charge. I mean, since I said that these fields were right and the better conjugate here, so uh, so this field here has a minus one. The other one has charge per plus one. You take the conjugate minus one. You take the bar plus one again. So uh, that has also charge zero. And then there is a zero and a zero here. And it happens that these um, neutrinos, uh, because of these terms here, neutrinos will mix with these uh, dark neutrinos. But nevertheless, uh, 
the mass matrix still has a uh, zero eigenvalue. If you want, these two lines here are uh, proportional to each other. So the determinant is zero. So uh, the mass matrix does have a zero, uh, a, a zero eigenvalue, which means that the light neutrinos are actually massless still. And if you do neutrino physics, you might realize that this is almost the um, texture that you need to get inverse seesaw. And I'll get to that soon. So we need to do something else there. Now, why, why, why neutrino masses come out zero in this case? You see, neutrino masses uh, in this kind of model, they are related to a uh, lepton number violation. And if you think about it, I am never violating lepton number here because I can assign lepton number, uh, for instance, if the neutrino has lepton number one, this guy has the opposite lepton number, and then you just assign whatever you need there uh, with the other field and that's it. So what you need to do is to add yet another scalar field where now it's a uh, it did scale of your field is going to do the um uh the breaking of lepton number so neutrino masses will be proportional to the value of the scalar field so let's call it s because it's a standard model singlet and since you need to connect uh n n prime of n prime or n with n it needs to have u1 charge two so now that you have that you can write something like yukawa let me call uh, prime um, s2 and for instance prime and prime uh, so this has lepton number uh, sorry uh, u1 dark minus one minus one plus two so that's okay and you can always write this other term uh, s2 star and and here so now this mass matrix becomes something like um, I don't really care about that entry in the middle of the mass matrix for whatever reason, as long as it's not so large, like much larger than everything else. I, I, I'll write it just for the sake of it, but uh, it's not very important. Here is a Y, uh, maybe double prime here. Y prime S2. So, um, so the point is that as long as this Y double prime S2 is not super large, uh, it doesn't play an important role in the neutrino mass generation if you have the Y prime S2. So let's take it to zero just for simplicity. Uh, but but it, it, this is not a, um, it's not going to change any of our conclusions here. So now what happens is that this is precisely the uh, mass matrix that you need to get inverse seesaw. And indeed uh, here, neutrino masses, the light neutrino masses come out as the parameter that violated lepton number. So let me make this as a VEV. And then you have Y square phi one uh, tilde VEV square over M square. And the mixing between, uh, let me add another page yet. And the mixing between uh, neutrinos and uh, uh, these uh, dark, dark neutrinos is something that goes like uh, basically Y phi over n, okay? So now I have a model where if these fields get a VEV, uh, the, the smallness of this VEV will be related to the smallness of neutrino masses. And if you have a, a small VEV, it means that you have new physics at a low scale. So what I found find personally attractive in this kind of model is that uh, you relate the light neutrino masses with new physics at the low scale, instead of the usual seesaw where you relate the lightness of neutrino masses with a very, very high scale. So uh, there's only one problem left here, which is if you try to, um, to just give like Mexican hat potentials to these fields, they, um, you end up with a goldstone. There is a, there is a, um, there is a, a residual symmetry that you're breaking, a, a global symmetry that you're breaking spontaneously, and you end up with a goldstone. So um, you still need to add one one last field, uh, which is a scalar singlet. Oh, what what did I do here? I, I'm sorry. This should be charge two. 
right? In the yeah, uh, over there I said it right. You add a singlet with charge one under this U1 dark, and that's everything that you need, right? So, uh, how can you explain these small valves for these fields uh, in a reasonable manner, right? Without without getting a big hierarchy problem. So. Uh, let me know if you have any questions at any point. Huh? And if I if I say something that you don't think is right, just, just shout at me. So, okay, so now I have a doublet with charge one, a singlet with charge one, a singlet with charge two, which means that I have terms in my potential, in my scalar potential like this, S1 square, S2 star, and then there is a mu. There is um, S1, phi one, maybe I need a star here and the Higgs. Let, let me call the Higgs, which has no U1 dark quantum numbers, just capital H, a dagger here and some U prime. And I might still have another um, oh, mu, I don't know, double prime, uh, S1, S2, phi one, H. And I may just need to make sure that I, don't mess this up. So this this is actually a lambda, if you want. It it it's a quartic, right? So there there's no dimension there. And I think this is it. Yeah, I think this is it. So now these parameters in the potential, uh, although they look a little bit complicated and and, and a bit mysterious, uh, maybe uh, what they do is very simple. If you recall uh, things like type two C saw. Uh, where the valve of a scalar field is induced by a tadpole, which shows up when another field gets a valve. This is precisely it. For instance, imagine that for the Higgs boson, you have a potential like a Mexican hat. For this S1, uh, this is like a leading order uh, statement, no? Because you have a whole potential coupling, coupling uh, uh, all fields, etc., etc. So just, just get the overall picture. Uh, S1 with a uh, Mexican hat potential. But then imagine that the mass of S2, the, the mass term is actually positive. And the same is true for the mass of phi. Okay. If, if this happens, then S2 and phi don't want to get a valve because their, their mass terms are positive. But when uh, S2 and phi one, but when S1 gets a VEV, these terms here will induce a tadpole for these fields, which means that they will get their VEVs. So diagrammatically, this means the following. When, so this is mu, this is S2, S1, S1. So when S1 gets a VEV, that's a tadpole for S2. So S2 gets a VEV. And the valve of S2 is approximately something like the mu term, which is the thing that breaks a global symmetry associated to these fields. Um, what else? The valve of S1 square over the mass of S2. This is very similar to what happened in a, a type two seesaw. And the same happens for the, the, the phi. If you want, the phi goes like this. Take this away. The phi goes like this, phi one, where was it? Uh, HS1, HS1, a mu prime. So the valve of phi one becomes something like mu prime, valve of H, valve of S1 over M phi one square. So now you see that uh, why these valves that break um, lepton number and therefore the valves related to neutrino masses why they are small. They are small not because you put small parameters by hand, but they are small because the fields that, that got these valves that are breaking lepton number, they are actually heavy. So you, if you make these fields at the TV scale and these parameters are around the GV, for instance, you get 10 to the six suppression, 10 to the three suppression, et cetera, et cetera. So making a long story short, uh, the diagram that <laughs> Just before you continue, is uh, maybe this is a naive question, but is the is the positivity of mass, as you mentioned, the only condition for for uh, the fields not developing a valve? 
because I, I would assume that uh, the the vacuum instability equations for these fields are all coupled, right? They are all coupled. That's true. That's true. So the the, the statements here they are like a very uh, simplified statements. So basically what I'm thinking is this, imagine that I start with a, a potential, let me call it a toy potential, where I only have S2, for instance, and I write it as plus S2 square, S2, S2, plus lambda, whatever, S2, S2, S2 uh, square. Yeah. This potential has no value. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm doing is that I'm perturbing this potential, right? Imagine that I, I do exactly the same, but for the other fields as well, for the, the S2 and the phi field. So without other couplings, these fields would not have VABs and they're, they're, this, the, the global symmetries associated with them would not be broken. Mm -hmm. What will uh, induce a VAB for this field is precisely these terms here. Mm -hmm. Because if you want, the potential is X squared but when S1 gets a VEV, if you look at this guy here, when S1 gets a VEV, S2 has a tadpole. Mm -hmm. So uh, tadpoles always induce a, 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 a displacement on the minimum, right? If you want, the, the first derivative has a, a constant term, the first derivative of the potential with respect to the field, which means that uh, Whatever you do, if if this term is there and this term should be there for you know if if it's an allowed term should be there, there's no reason why it should be zero. Then uh, necessarily S two will get a vev. And now the the, the smallness of the vev of S two has nothing to do with a small parameter by, that I put by hand. It has something to do with uh, a uh, difference in scales. Okay, mm -hmm. of course, if the scales are all the same then the VEV of S2 is equal to the VEV of S1 or very similar. But even a, a, a say, 0.1 suppression, right? Say that the VEV of S1 is 10 GeV and the mass of this S2 is 100 GeV. Uh, this is uh, 10 to minus two. If mu is also around the 10 GeV with respect to the weak scale, that's a 10 to the minus three and so on. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're taking a little bit of suppression from many different terms. Uh, to get to neutrino masses, that I'll, as I'll show you uh, in a minute. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so the diagram that gives you neutrino masses. Let me take this guy up. Is basically this one, uh, where. So let me see if I can go through it with you. Uh, so, so basically, you start with a neutrino here. Okay. You connect, uh, let me just copy that mass matrix. So you start with a neutrino here. <clears throat> uh, sorry. You connect with a, a, the N via this guy, so the phi. But then phi has that uh, coupling that I told you before with Higgs and S1. Uh, <clears throat> And now uh, you have a mass for between n and n prime, which is just the normal mass, the vector-like mass. Then n prime gets this guy here, this S2, which gets a VEV via S1, and back to n, and then back to neutrino. And what this gives you is, uh, it's actually very interesting that now neutrino masses, if you want, uh, just before we show the equation, just, just getting uh, uh, some ideas of, of order of magnitude, neutrino masses here, should go like, so you have the VEV of the Higgs showing twice. So let's call it V square. You have the VEV of S1 showing four times, S1 uh, to the four. You have one mu here, one mu here, one mu here. So uh, I call them, I think mu prime square and the other one is mu. And then you have the masses of the right-handed neutrinos you have the mass of phi twice, and you have the mass of S2. And I hope the dimensions are right, huh? Uh, eight, uh, eight, nine, okay, perfect. Oof, good. So, uh, so now you see that instead of having the usual relations, the neutrino mass is now, uh, you do have a Higgs VEV here, which is not a small parameter, but these parameters here, they could be uh, slightly below the electroic symmetry, the electroic uh, scale, 
while these masses could be maybe at around the electric scale, some of them could be lighter. But you see that you could clearly get a, a several orders of magnitude suppression out of this. So uh, if you write this in a more precise way, uh, this theory leads to an effective uh, operator, which is actually dimension, um, dimension nine, if you want. No, here is not dimension nine because I'm writing this in terms of phi. But if I write in terms of h, then every phi gets substituted by some uh, h s one. So the 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 operator that gives mass neutrinos in uh, type one seesaw uh, or type two or type three in the usual seesaw is is dimension five. So you get something that mass of the neutrino it, it goes like v square over lambda. This is the usual thing. In this kind of model, the mass of the neutrino is a dimension nine operator, which goes something like, naively, it would go like a V uh, dimension nine. Uh, so it's lambda to the fifth V over six, V to the six. But in fact, in our case, it, it, it's even more than that. It goes like this. Let me call some other VABs to the fourth and then, or, or mu's to the fourth and then lambda uh, to the fifth. Okay, I think this is right. So, um, <clears throat> so that means that now the scale that generate neutrino mass is much, much lower. So good, we have uh, an interesting model for neutrino masses where- Excuse me, uh, I'm yeah. a bit curious about uh, um, um, the same diagram, but uh, instead of having giving a bed for S1, you make a loop. Uh, oh, yeah. just connecting the those s ones and uh, uh, get uh, the major five operator an it's a that, loop. that's an excellent mm -hmm. question uh, you could you could so if i understood what you're saying you could close this guy here for instance you could exactly. close uh, maybe uh, that one's going to be ugly but still you could uh, close yeah, the other right. one uh, and <laughs> right. that will go back to a dimension five right that's exactly. true you, you yeah. can do that uh, and mm -hmm. one needs to see uh, if the two loop suppressed di dimension five operator mm -hmm. is, is larger or smaller than the dimension nine mm -hmm. operator. So there are, mm -hmm. there are studies, for instance, by uh, one, of, one of my collaborators actually of this paper, uh, Sudip Jana, where they have shown mm -hmm. that when you do um, uh, some hybrid type uh, one, two seesaw with dimension seven operators, there is mm -hmm. a whole region of parameter space where the dominant one is the loop, cl the closed loop dimension five. And that does change ah. the spinning analogy. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Does it apply find, to this? Mm -hmm. So you can always find a region in parameter space where the dimension nine is the dominant mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can also always find a region where the loop is the dominant one. So uh, so yeah, we didn't look into the loop thing. Uh, we, we, we knew mm -hmm. it was there, but for simplicity, we just said, well, let's work mm -hmm. in the easy. Uh, uh, parameter space. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's I an see. excellent question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so we have this and the new thing here is the following that, uh, as I told you, this, there is a gauge boson, right? Because this U1, let me call it X. This U1 is a gauge symmetry. So whenever you have, for instance, N, it couples to X. And the nice thing about this model is that in, in the inverse seesaw uh, style, no, in the inverse seesaw texture, like this one here, the, um, the mixing between the neutrino and this guy, the N, not the N prime, but the N is actually fairly large. Uh, the, the mixing, as I told you before, could be something like Y phi, uh, Vevo phi over M. And, and, and well, these things are up to some extent free parameters, but the point is, uh, the you can make the mixing fairly large. You can you can easily have a mixing, uh, for instance, type one. If you try to lower the scale of of your sea salt to the GV scale, the mix is like neutrino mass divided by by mass of the sterile, which if it's one EV over a GV, that's ten to the minus nine. Here you could easily have a mixing square of ten to the minus six if you wanted. So that opens up some very interesting phenomenology like this, that a neutrino via mixing could actually upscatter to one of these dark neutrinos via the, the new mediator. The other thing is that since this is a U1, 
you can always have kinetic mixing, which is uh, basically you say that you can always have something like this in your Lagrangian, F mu nu, um, let me write uh, the proper one, B mu nu, uh, where B is the, the, the field strength of the uh, um, U1 hypercharge, and F mu nu prime, where this is the U1, the U1 dark, and this induces a mixing between this new gauge boson. Uh, I think I called this new gauge boson Z dark uh, later. So let me try to stick with my notation. It mixes with the photon, which now can interact with stuff like normal stuff, like electrons, protons, etc. So this gives you a whole new phenomenology uh, uh, for neutrinos because now your neutrinos. So there is a, a gauge boson that in some sense couples, well, not in some sense, it couples more strongly to neutrinos than to everything else because it couples to neutrinos due to the mass mechanism. While it couples to everything else due to the kinetic mixing. So if neutrinos have a large-ish, not, not really large, but a relatively large, not so small, mixing with these dark neutrinos, then you could have a uh, gauge boson that couples more strongly to neutrinos than to everything else. In some sense, a neutrinophilic gauge boson. It doesn't come out for free because now you have uh, uh, new states. And these new states, you cannot just make them uh, arbitrarily large if you, if you want to keep uh, things like um, uh, um, natron is under control. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about natron is here. So, okay, so this is the model part. And, and I'm going to stop now on the model and go for the experimental part and try to connect them. So is there any, any question on the model side? Or can I, uh, can I talk about Miniboon now? The, uh, so the small web of, of these new scalars will also imply a light Z dark. Yes. And that's a key feature of the model. Because now that you're trying to generate neutrino masses with a low with a dynamical uh, mechanism at the low scales, there is no way you can avoid having uh, light particles in your in the game now. Okay. And um, and yes, you will have a light Z prime. And then in making a long story short, all hell will break loose because of the light Z prime. Mm -hmm. Right. For instance, if you have kinetic mixing, all constraints from kinetic mixing will apply on this light Z prime. But now you also have the coupling to neutrinos, which usual like dark photons do not have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. This and, uh, and, yeah, and mixing this, between Z Z dark. Is the mixing good. between Z and Z dark. Um, there is mixing, uh, but uh, <clears throat> so okay. So kinetic mixing comes from this guy here, right? From the uh, sorry, this guy here, and this is a free parameter. Z Z dark mass mixing is a little bit more tricky. Uh, if you want, like, just think about the normal Higgs. The normal Higgs is charged under U2, uh, 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 SU2 left and U1 uh, hypercharge. And therefore, the B and the W3 mix to form the Z and the photon. So to have a, a ZZ prime mixing, you also need to have a Higgs that has uh, uh, quantum numbers under SU2 left, U1 hypercharge, and U1 dark. Yeah. And we do <laughs> have it, the five. Yeah, so, okay. but the thing is that the mixing, um, it's typically suppressed like VEV of phi uh, divided by electroweak scale. The mixing between, let's say, the sine, theta, z, z prime. It typically goes like this, you know, up to some other details. But um, if you want to make your, your, your whole um, phenomenology light, then uh, what happens is that the VEV of phi should be much lower than the VEV of the Higgs, right? So imagine that the VEV of phi is below the GV scale, then this mixing goes to like 10 to the minus four, uh, and that becomes very small. And notice that this, um, in some sense, this, this actually, uh, there is something here that I didn't write. Uh, which is actually important. There is a gauge coupling of this U1 dark as well, and the gauge coupling of the Higgs, uh, mm -hmm. of the SU2, no? 
But typically this, if you write in terms of physical stuff, is mass of the new gauge boson divided by the mass of the Z. So if your new gauge boson is at say 100, G, 100 MeV scale, then the mixing with the Z is going to be very small. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, but yes, it is something that you need to worry. And uh, uh, okay. you, one might want to live in a regional parameter space where this mix is not so large because then that would give rise to stuff like uh, parity violation at low scales. Mm -hmm. Like atomic parity violation can easily uh, constrain mm -hmm. these models, can strongly constrain these models. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. So, um, okay. So let me go to uh, uh, Minibone. And then I'll let you, I'll let you know uh, how these two things are connected. So Minibone uh, is an experiment at Fermilab where they have observed a, um, an anomalous result, basically an excess of events of a kind of event over the expected uh, background. So the, 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 recent, the most recent paper by Minibone is this one. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the papers that I showed you are from 2018, so uh, it, it, it's not based on this one because it violates causality, but the results didn't change so much, right? Uh, the point is, so let me just give you a, a very, very quick overview of Minibone. So Minibone is the following. You shoot protons in a target. Uh, and if there are experimentalists, I apologize for my uh, bad drawings. Uh, you produce a bunch of, of mesons. Most of them are, are, are pi on, especially pi plus, but you also have pi minuses, k ons, etc. Then you have a magnetic horn system where you focus the pi ons of the, the, the charge that you want. So you can focus pi plus or pi minus. Then after that, you have a decay pipe where uh, there's a magnetic horn where uh, pions will eventually decay, say mu and neutrino. And then you have an absorber and a bunch of dirt to essentially stop the muons, right? You want to stop them. Uh, you don't want muons getting to your detector. And then after all that, you put your detector here. So uh, the, the neutrino beam is mostly composed by new mu, but then there is a small, uh, Let's say that this is the flux. There is a some contamination of numu bar, small contamination of nui, uh, sorry, nui, and very small of nui bar, right? So um, uh, it's dominated by numu. Now, how do you detect these neutrinos? Uh, the mini bone detector is a um, mineral oil detector, I think. Yes, it's a mineral oil detector where uh, it can see both um, Cherenkov light uh, and scintillation light. So when your new mu arrives at your at, at the detector, it creates a muon. And the muon, uh, let me make this a bit more realistic. The muon leaves the detector, no? And the muon, uh, oh, this is a terrible choice. The muon uh, radiates Sharonkov light and the detector is a sphere. So in the sphere, you see some pattern of Sharonkov light say something like this, no? Then uh, if what you have is an electron, if what you have is an electron, and I apologize that this thing is going a little bit over, but uh, I don't think we're going to lose much. Electrons may uh, leave the detector or not. It also emits Sharonkov light. But electrons are light, so when they travel in a dense material, they kind of go around, they kick stuff, etc. So the Sharonkov ring is a little bit different. Uh, for instance, it could be more, you know, more fuzzy. Uh, and the other thing that is interesting is that uh, photons do not emit Sharonkov light, so Minibone cannot see photons. But photons in media they convert to a plus and minus. And this plus and minus is so collimated that the sharing of light that they emit is on top of each other. So you cannot distinguish uh, by looking at the light, a photon from an electron in minibone. And this is key to what we are going to say. 
But uh, Minibon had expected backgrounds for uh, the amount of Nui and Nui bar that we would see, or as, as they say, the, the electron-like events. So the beam is dominated by Nu mu's. Uh, if the beam was perfect, you would not have Nui's, um, but you have some contamination, small, but you have something. Nevertheless, they observed 600 events uh, over the background with an error bar of 130, which is basically a five sigma. They, they took data in neutrino mode where you focus one kind of pions to get mostly nu mu's, but also they took data in anti-neutrino mode where you get mostly nu mu bar. And both modes show a consistent excess um, uh, over the background. This excess under the interpretation of sterile neutrinos, so a, a, a neutrino that would have a mass splitting of order one electron volt square, is consistent with the old LSND um, uh, anomaly. But uh, just in a nutshell, uh, and, and this will be very short because it's not the topic of the talk, but under the sterile neutrino hypothesis, so basically imagine that you have a delta M square that is of order one EV square, so that when neutrinos oscillate, the thing that shows up is not the usual, the oscillation phase is not the usual delta M square, but is this new one. So you can have oscillation at much shorter uh, distances. Uh, the problem is that to oscillate from mu neutrino to electron neutrino passing through a sterile, in some sense, very, very uh, schematic, you need to go from nu mu to nu sterile and go back to Nui. This is very, very schematic, okay? Don't quote me on that if you're doing real calculations. But the point is that to have a Numu to Nui appearance in short baselines, short baselines, it requires necessarily both Numu to Numu non-zero disappearance and Nui to Nui disappearance. And the problem is that experiments that measure this see some non-zero mixing between what could be a sterile and, uh, and the, the, the normal neutrinos. But experiments which see especially this channel, the Numu disappearance didn't see anything. So there is a, a four sigma tension basically between appearance experiments, the ones that saw, uh, so let me call this appearance, and disappearance experiment. Uh, and this tension is at the same level as the, um, uh, as the anomaly, right? And I'm not even mentioning uh, cosmology here. So the sterile neutrino inter interpretation of Minibon is actually under a lot of tension. So it's not clear that sterile neutrinos actually can do the job, which means that we should, uh, we should probably look for other possibilities for other ways of explaining this anomaly. And I'll give you the way uh, of combining this model that I told you here of neutrino masses with uh, the explanation of the mini boon excess. So the explanation is very simple. Uh, is actually strikingly simple. You have a beam of neutrinos, right? Of, of say muon neutrinos. Now I told you that uh, because of the neutrino mass model, mu neutrinos mixes with the dark neutrino. Let me put a D there so that I call it dark. And the dark neutrinos couple to the Z dark, which uh, mixes with the photon. And then you can scatter on uh, uh, nuclei. No? Now, up there, the Z dark, uh, sorry, the, the, when the, the uh, dark neutrino talks via the Z dark to the to nuclei, it is scattered. And this dark neutrino, because there is a U1 symmetry, so there is a new gauge boson, and there is, um, uh, uh, let, me let me take this in dark here, so I don't want to be confusing. 
this dark neutrino, because there is a U1 gauge boson and there is mixing, a, a large mixing, because that's a typical thing of inverse seesaw, it can decay back to the normal neutrino. It doesn't matter which. And a dark Z. And again, through the same kinetic mixing that we had before, this guy can decay to a pair of E plus E minus, okay? So, uh, so this is the most important uh, thing of this model for explaining midi boom that neutrinos, because they mix with the states that carry this uh, a dark uh, dark number, they uh, they have another kind of interaction and they they can upscatter to heavy particles, which decays back to neutrinos and e plus e minus. Okay, so this guy here, for instance, it goes like the coupling of the dark sector, and there is a mixing. Let me call mu four for a, a fourth neutrino. Uh, uh, there's a mixing term there. This mixing here is basically kinetic mixing. This coupling here is like uh, electric charge, no? But then after you produce this guy on shell, it will decay no matter what you do. So the rest of the diagram here, that part is an on-shell decay of a dark neutrino, so you're not paying for these couplings. So basically, what I'm telling you is that the, the cross-section uh, for this will typically go like, so there is a, a gauge coupling square. Sorry, I think this is not square. Apologies. So the, the, this is the amplitude level, right? So there is no, no mixing square. The mixing square shows up when you uh, square the amplitude. There is this, there is a mixing square. There is a kinetic mixing. There is some uh, uh, electric uh, charge. There is some charge of the nucleus. Uh, let me not put the charge of the nucleus here. I, I'll go back to that in a second. Uh, and uh, well, you typically have something like S no, this is a cross section, and you have mass of the z dark to the fourth. And if you compare that to the usual cross section, the standard model for a neutrino uh, nui uh, electron scattering, typically goes like G, uh, G Fermi square S, where this is basically S over mz to the fourth. So now you see that on one hand, you have several terms suppressing your cross section. But on the other hand, you're getting uh, enhanced because you have the mass of the Z dark instead of the mass of the Z. And if the Z dark is say at the 100 MeV scale, while the Z is at the 100 GeV scale, these three orders of magnitude get powered up to the fourth. And now you get a 10 to the 12 enhancement. So you can live with fairly small couplings here and still explain the mini boon excess. To explain the mini boon excess, what you need is that around 0.3% of your new move flux leads to electron-like events. Okay, so um, so you you kind of need in very very like broad uh, style uh, this cross section to be about 0.3% of this one. So then you uh, do the calculations uh, in, and and you see what is a uh, uh, ruled out and what is not ruled out. Um, but, oh, I forgot to say something very important. Um, I told you that Minibon uh, can distinguish particles from the Sharonkov cone, but uh, what Minibon calls an electron-like event is a uh, something consistent with the Sharonkov light of a single electron. And I'm telling you here that my new particle is actually decaying to two electrons, right? So how can it be that this is the same? And the reason is because if the Z dark, if this dark Z is very light, it will be produced very boosted. And when it decays, the opening angle of the plus and minus is very small. So that gives you uh, the mass, the necessary mass for this, uh, this Z dark. The Z dark cannot be heavy because if it is, when it decays to plus and minus, it will decay opened up. And you will see the two, uh, the two different Cherenkov rings there, like a pi zero, for instance, when decay to E plus, uh, sorry, 
to a photon, photon, photon. The photons converge, you, uh, Minibone can actually see these rings and, and identify the pi zero. Uh, the same cannot happen here. So uh, this Sharonkov rings here needs to be on top of each other. So the opening angle, uh, say the E plus E minus opening angle here, theta E E, if I remember correctly, uh, cosine of theta E E needs to be larger than 0.99. So definitely there will be events where uh, there, you know, the cosine of this theta E is a little bit larger. Uh, and this event will not be classified as excess. This event will be classified as pi zero background. Uh, but if most of the events are uh, very collimated, have E plus E minus pairs very collimated, then mini boon would classify that as E plus E minus. So you do the calculation and this is what we get. Um, let me make these guys a little bit larger. So this is uh, the spectrum of, maybe I should make it even larger. The spectrum of, uh, uh, let, let's first look at the, this one, the, the two ones here uh, up. So this is the reconstructed neutrino energy in MEV uh, and the event spectrum, okay? Uh, reconstructed neutrino energy is not a trivial quantity. It's, um, is a slightly complicated beast because you need to assume how the interaction uh, happened because you don't know the, the energy of the incoming neutrino. You need to reconstruct that. And there, there's a, there are several particles which, are, which may be uh, invisible in these detectors, but still you can, you can uh, do a proxy and, 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 and define what you mean by reconstructed neutrino energy. And this is what the experiment uh, does. Uh, all these uh, histograms here are background. So these guys here, for instance, they are background from intrinsic Nui. I told you that the mini bone beam has Nui in it. So that's a background for the search. The big red one is a misidentified pi naught. And the other ones are less important things. Well, there's a, a delta background where neutrino up scatters a resonance inside the nucleus and then the delta can decay to a neutron and a photon. And then the photon just looks like an electron-like event. But there is also stuff like dirt event, etc. These are less important. I'm not going to discuss them. But and uh, you see here the data, right? And the data is clearly above the background. So if we fit this model to the data, this is what we get. And you see that uh, you get a very, very good agreement. You see that there is some uh, uh, statistical error here and systematic error there. But uh, overall, the agreement is really good. Uh, these three beams, they are somewhat correlated on their uncertainties. So if you move uh, them one sigma up, you, are, you basically paid one single sigma for these three beams because they are very correlated due to this uh, uh, pi naught uh, background, which picks on the, on the last uh, three beams, on the first three beams. And this is the equivalent for antineutrinos. So you see that the energy fit is fairly good, but there is another thing that uh, Minibun looks at, which is the angular distribution of these events. So your, um, what Minibun uh, uh, intends to see is neutrino uh, scattering to an electron. So if a Nui comes and scatters to an electron, you can define this angle here. Let me call, how do they call it? Just theta. This angle here, which is the angle of the outgoing reconstructed electron with respect to the beam. This is not the same as this one. This angle here is the aperture between the two, the plus and minus pair, which Minibun is actually not looking for that. But whenever an event has two Sharonkov rings that they can actually identify, that's background for them. That's not signal. But this, uh, uh, it, it, it turns out to be quite important, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, angle here. And if you see here, they have uh, backgrounds again. And you see that most of the events are in the forward direction, but there are some events going backwards. And this model does predict lots of events in the forward direction. It's a very good fit to this forward region here. In the backward region is not so great, uh, to be honest. It's uh, okay. But um, in this new publication, apparently, uh, it seems that the excess of events is even more peaked in the forward direction with a overall flat 
uh, uh, backward um, uh, component of the signal. So uh, we still didn't do the, the fit with this. Um, you know, nobody did it yet as far as I know, but uh, it, it's something that could be interesting to have a look at. If to see if the, with the new data and the new analysis that they're doing where they reduce the backgrounds, if they actually get, uh, this model gets a better fit or, or a worse fit um, uh, to the excess. And the final thing for the theories um, is this. Um, so this is the allowed region in parameter space. So this is the mass of the dark neutrino. This is the mixing angle square. Uh, and these are constraints, these guys here, are model independent constraints from uh, meson decay, et cetera. Whenever, for instance, if you have a pion that decays to mu, nu, mu, uh, if the nu, mu mixes with a heavy neutrino, say a 10 MeV neutrino, then the spectrum of the muon changes, right? The, the, the muon line changes, and that, that has a very strong constraint. So here you have, um, uh, I guess, a pi naught, you have kaons here, you have um, flavor universality over there, and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the minimum collaboration only provides information to do a fit with this data, with this information here. They do not provide enough information to do a fit with the angular distribution. So the angular distribution is not included here in this figure, but I can tell you that basically around here, to that side, like about 90 or 99, I, I don't remember the exact number, but most of the events by far are in the forward direction are in the first bin here. So the region to the left of this line is not actually a very good fit by eye, no? but the, we, we can't do anything because there is no information there. The region to the right would be a good fit, uh, again, by eye to the uh, uh, angular distribution. So you see that now you're predicting uh, uh, dark neutrinos. So imagine that we get something like here. We're predicting dark neutrinos at the, 420 keV, uh, sorry, MeV. Oh, what am I doing? MeV scale, okay. Uh, and uh, mixins of about uh, 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight, which is not so large. Uh, the mass of the Z-dark is important because you want to have collimated pairs of a plus and minus. And uh, for this, we use a, this guy here, a 30 MeV. It's um, close to the constraints of dark photons, but it's not ruled out by dark searches, as long as the kinetic mixing is around this uh, amount here. This is alpha epsilon square about 10 to the minus 10. So maybe alpha is like 10 to the minus four. So, uh, and then the the... The alpha dark on the, Z, on, the, on the U1 dark side, we use it one over four. This value is a little bit large, but uh, keep in mind that you have uh, wiggle room here. You also have wiggle room here. So you can easily make this alpha dark uh, uh, smaller by a factor 10 if you want. It, it wouldn't be a, a big deal. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's it. There has been uh, uh, other works that also look into this. For instance, I, I just highlight three of them here. Uh, one is this um, uh, this one that came out right after our paper, uh, looking at a heavier mediator regime, where basically instead of having uh, the dark neutrino at the 400 MeV scale and the Z prime at the 30 MeV scale, they flip at that so that they have the dark neutrino at the MeV scale, one MeV or so, as long as it decays with plus and minus and something else, and the Z dark at the GeV scale. Uh, so that 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 actually gives a slightly better uh, angular fit, but um, there are other complications that show up where uh, you need to have large mixings with tau neutrinos that would be ruled out, or you need to invoke like a, a two um, dark neutrinos where you produce say N five which decays to N4 Z dark, N4 goes away of your attack and then the Z dark goes to plus and minus. Or, um, well, in their case, since this is a, is a um, 
heavy mediator is three body decay. No, it's N5 decays to N4 plus E minus, and then the N4 just leaves the detector. Uh, there are also papers looking at signatures of this uh, model in other detectors. So these guys here, they, they specifically look, this is actually quite interesting. They looked into uh, the constraints from the CHARM2 experiment and the Minerva experiment. And it seems that they cut, uh, these constraints actually cut right in the middle of this. Uh, of course, the, the difficulty there is that they are reanalyzing old data uh, and the, the search is fully dominated by systematic errors and reanalyzing old data fully dominated by systematic errors is a little bit tricky. So if you allow the systematics to vary, uh, this line go up and down uh, a bit. Uh, and then there was the last paper that I want to mention was a, um, a combination of, uh, so using the same model, but now uh, looking at more stuff. And apparently the same model can explain the, not only the, the mini bone anomaly, but also the G minus two of the muon and uh, some uh, discrepancy that Babar observed in uh, upsilon to uh, monophoton. Um, and there are a few names here. This, I apologize, is not a uh, uh, all-inclusive list, um, but yeah, that, that, that was the best I could come up with. So I apologize if you're not here. So uh, yeah, with that, I would like to thank you and, and, and ask uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Is there any question or comment? Uh, yeah, just wondering by I, the, um, it seemed that your model gave more uh, more additional events in the anti-neutrino mode than in the neutrino mode, or at least uh, the fit is uh, is better. Is there any anything behind that? Yes, there is something behind that. Um, the thing behind that is that uh, when this so uh, well, so first, uh, anti-neutrino sees a smaller excess. Right when you compare to neutrinos, so that 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 like in 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 models where you don't distinguish them, that will always be an issue. Uh, although you are well within this the statistical plus systematic error bars, but uh, as you said, uh, since you see less excess on antineutrinos, if you predict the same in both, then uh, uh, you, antineutrinos get a little bit more than what it should, and. Um, uh, in this model, what is fun is that what dominates the scattering, because the Z prime is very, very light, is actually coherent scattering. So uh, here, when you scatter on the nuclei, you could scatter on individual uh, nucleons, or you could even do DIS. But because the mediator mass is so light, the cross-section for coherent scattering blows up. Uh, well, it blows up up to the mass of the mediator, but it, it really shoots up, and then like, um, 90 or 95 percent of this cross section comes from coherent scattering in nuclei. In nuclei, so uh, basically, a neutrino comes uh, up, scatters something, and the nucleus is recoiled as a whole and very, very slowly. So you don't see anything on the nucleus side. So uh, because it's coherent scattering, the cross section for neutrinos and antineutrinos is exactly the same. More questions? I have somehow related to uh, his question uh, about uh, a CP phase in a, a mixing angle. Because in, in Higgs sector, there should be some, uh, some room to include some additional CP phase. And I'm wondering if that CP phase could be propagated into the a mixing, mixing between active and strong neutrino. And then that makes some difference between a neutrino event and anti-neutrino events. That's a very good question. Uh, in principle, yes, there is a, a CP phase that could show up in uh, the mixing, but at least in the most simple realization and the most simple phenomenology, if you want, it's not even realization, it's phenomenology. 
if you see here, if you want really to do like an inverse seesaw and all that, you need three dark neutrinos, right? Three pairs of mm -hmm. N dark and N prime dark. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just dealing with one just for simplicity. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you deal with one alone, then you only have mm -hmm. one coupling uh, uh, model square. So the phase goes away. You could have um, a small um, interference between this diagram and another diagram directly with the Z, where, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, in some sense, the neutrino inherits a uh, dark coupling because it mixes with the dark neutrino. Therefore, the dark neutrino mm -hmm. inherits a, a Z coupling because it mixes with the neutrino. The only thing mm -hmm. is that the Z is so heavy, uh, and then mm -hmm. you have a mixing on top of it that this, these amplitudes too small. Mm -hmm. But in principle, because mm -hmm. we have now two amplitudes and there is a different phase, there could be a different phase mm -hmm. uh, if you had, let's say, mm -hmm. N dark one and N dark two, then things could be much mm -hmm. more uh, complex. But, um, mm -hmm. and that could give you some difference between neutrinos and anti neutrinos. But mm -hmm. it turns out that at least for the, the region of parameter space that we are looking at and the, sim the simplified thing we are looking at, like one single, you know, the, the minimum mm -hmm. amount of particles to make this work, CP mm -hmm. phase is not important. I see, I see. So if you have more than one ND, then the ND propagator in this diagram could be yeah. uh, NDI, something like that, and you have much brown amplitude, for instance, and some interference comes up. And... For instance, yeah. I see. Yeah. But I, 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 so at least in, 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 in what we have seen, at least for, mm -hmm. for a single ND, there is, it's not mm -hmm. that CP violation is small, is that there is no CP violation at all. If you have two, I think mm -hmm. there is CP violation, but I would, I would bet it's very small if you I want see. to explain minibond. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't want to explain minibond, then it's a, it's a, it's a framework, no? It's a, it's a framework where we have a mm -hmm. neutrino yeah. pillic uh, Z prime. Right. And I, I think that okay, there you could, you. Have a, you could have a CP value. Yeah. No, I have a question. So this N N D is is decay to neutrino and electron and the decay width of this is how small? So the the decay width, it, um, because ND is 400 MeV, the decay width it is uh, fairly small. We can we can kind of estimate here. No, the, the decay width it would be something like, uh, this is a two body decay. So it's basically mass of ND, uh, gauge coupling square, mixing, square and that's it um yeah and that's it this is the decay if you want the decay of nd to z dark neutrino because this now it's a it's a chain decay right so uh, everything's on shell um so if i go back here to this plot we use an uh, alpha z dark point uh, one over four and um the mixing you need is about 10 to the minus eight, mixing square, okay? Uh, mixing square there. So uh, what you have is 10 to the minus eight here. You have one over four there. There may be some factor of like 16 pi, maybe. So it becomes fairly small, right? This is like a the order 10 to the minus 10 mass of the ND. So the decay is prompt in this case. Uh, in the other realization of the model where um, ND is very light and Z dark is actually the, the GEV guy, then, uh, then it's, it's different because now it's a three body decay. So it goes like G Fermi dark, which is one over mass of the Z dark uh, to the four. Uh, so the, 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 yeah, so basically in the three body decay uh, regime, the this, the the end dark can actually decay dis lead to displaced vertices. Minibond cannot see that. Uh, the detector is just not not made for that. But if you imagine in uh, for instance liquid argon TPCs, you might be able to see that. No neutrino comes, 
hits a nucleus, ejects, say, a proton out of it. And then this guy propagates a bit and then decay three body, three plus and minus. Now you have uh, hadronic activity and then a plus and minus uh, separated by some distance, which is related to the, um, to the lifetime. So, so yeah. So in this realization, you don't need to worry, but if, if you do the other realization, yes. Okay. Any more questions? Hello. Uh, could you show the um, the last plot you show? Uh, this yes. one. Yes. On the right hand side, the uh, this uh, mini boom data is the uh, most recent one published last year, or no? This is not the one that they presented in uh, Neutrino ah. 2020. Okay. So the, this this I took from the paper that I wrote in 2018. So okay. uh, remember that the, the, the last, like the previous result, I think was 2013, right? And then mm -hmm. on 2018, on Neutrino 2018, actually, on the, uh, on the Friday before the week of their talk, they published mm -hmm. this, uh, this paper with the update. Um, and we I used see. that data. We okay. still didn't, didn't do the fit with the 2020 data. And here you f I find that the uh, constraint on the uh, U mu4 is a very strong uh, in the region of uh, around the 200 to 400 MeV. Yeah. And, and uh, is, is this because of the K on the K or? Yes, K on the Ks. K on the Ks uh, are very, very tricky. Very strong, strong, okay, I see. So the thing is, uh, Pi decay, you would expect it to be much stronger. But the problem is that the muon is already 105 MeV. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah, don't yeah, have right. so much mass left for mm -hmm. the dark neutrinos. Mm -hmm. uh, K on decay, it's K uh, to mu, uh, nu mu. And now uh, the muon mass is not super important in K on decay. The, 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 the neutrino is monochromatic at 236 MeV. And the muon has the rest of the energy. But now mm -hmm. if the neutrino has a mass, especially around the 100 to the 200 MeV scale, you strongly change the, the, the line of the muon. It is not even a spectral change, right? It's a, literally a line moving around. And, and that is, um, leads to a very, very strong constraint. This is the reason why, why you go so much down there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me, would you remind me, um, did, did, did you assume the mixing between electron neutrino and strand neutrino to be sufficiently small? Because- So and, yeah, so <laughs> we, we, in this realization, again, to make life simpler so that we don't need to analyze things mm -hmm. that depend on assumptions and all that, we assume that mm -hmm. the mixing of the dark neutrino to the muon neutrino mm -hmm. is the large one. Mm -hmm. All the other ones mm -hmm. are negligible. But in nice. principle, you could mm -hmm. have Nui and dark, and you could have Nu Tau mm -hmm. and dark. Mm -hmm. If you have the Nui one, then there is a lot of constraints that you also need to, uh, 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 you also need to solve. No, For instance, the, again, Pion and K on the K's play a role up to some extent. Mm -hmm. the branching ratio is small, but it's not that small uh, to electrons. Mm -hmm. uh, and also all the beta decays for much lower energies, etc. So yeah, so, right. so you could have a uh, mix in there, but we just set it to, to be, we set it to zero for simplicity, no? But the argument oh, yeah. being, mm -hmm. if it's a factor of a hundred lower, or you know, if it couples to another dark neutrino, which is much mm -hmm. heavier, say a hundred GV, then fine, we don't need to worry. Mm -hmm. But yes, yep. if, if you look at the model in, in its whole glory, you should have that mixing, and, and that should give you something in person as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comment? Yeah, it seems no more questions. So let's end today's uh, seminar. Thank you, Professor Pedro Machado. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank fun. you.
Bye, bye. Bye.